Hello, everyone, and welcome to Garden Gossip, the home and garden show, with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. The sad garden gossip is that, as we've all heard, domesticated honeybees and wild native bees are experiencing major population declines due to habitat loss, pesticides, and disease. But the good garden gossip is that there are ways we can be responsible. Dancy, do you want to be responsible? <laughs> of course. That's what David Mizajewski is back on Big Blend Radio to talk about today. He's going to share how we can be responsible in our gardens and communities. Uh, the first step is go to besponsible.com. Uh, David is the author of the how-to book, Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife. He's also a naturalist with the National Wildlife Federation, celebrating 18 years this week. And he's an expert spokesperson for the National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife program that since 1973 has been educating and empowering people to turn their garden spaces into thriving habitats for birds, butterflies, bees, and other wildlife. You can go to nwf.org forward slash garden. Hey, David, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me as always. Hey, and congratulations. 18 years at yeah. NWF, right? That's, That's a long right. Time. Yeah. This week I'm celebrating my 18th anniversary working at the National Wildlife Federation. And I kind of uh, slipped my mind until, um, you know, this morning. And I was like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, my my anniversary just passed. I started on July 10th of the year 2000. So yeah, the, the big milestone. Right on. Well, cool. congratulations. And, and you celebrated with a, a sting from a wasp, I heard. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to be talking about bees. And um, since you brought it up, um, for folks that are following me on social media, on Instagram or Facebook, um, I've been posting a series of videos chronicling my challenge with a wasp's nest that um, was built right along my deck landing and um, actually in houses that I had built or that I had installed for native bees. And that's exactly what the Be Sponsible campaign is really all about, which we'll talk about in a minute. But, um, you know, I, wasps are actually important wildlife. They're pollinators just like bees. And unlike bees, they actually are predatory. Many species are out there consuming actual insect pests in your garden. So I always practice, and, or I always preach, you know, we should have tolerance for wasps. They are important wildlife. And in most cases, they're not gonna mess with you as long as you don't mess with them. However, in some instances, which I learned, um, there, are, <laughs> there, are, there are you know, times and places where coexistence really just isn't possible. And because of where this particular is yellow jackets, which tend to be on the aggressive mm -hmm. side, um, they were building a nest in this little wooden structure that I had installed for native bees to nest in, and the wasps moved in at the top, and it was right on the railing of my deck, right on the deck landing. And so mm -hmm. all summer long, it's been fine, but they decided that they were going to get very protective this last week. So I got mm -hmm. stung on the hand, and for about a week, you know, kind of was swollen. Um, and then they got me again, like two nights ago on the other hand, well, they actually got me on both hands, but the worst one was on my, my right hand. And in the space of about 24 hours, my whole hand and forearm just got huge and swollen and painful. So I ended up going to the doctor and, you know, I of course have been diagnosed with a sting allergy. And so I had to go out and get an EpiPen because unfortunately what happens is your body just gets so um, sensitive to it. If I get stung again, it could be a really bad scenario. So unfortunately, I am the naturalist that is allergic to nature because I'm allergic to poison ivy and pollen and pet dander and everything else, but it's my lot in life. So um, anyway, I really wanted to get rid of these wasps without having to spray toxic pesticides. Mm -hmm. And I that's what I did in my video series. So again, if you follow me on Instagram, I did a whole Instagram TV series that I cross-posted to Facebook um, on Facebook, you can find me at Naturalist David Mizajewski. Um, and on Instagram, I'm just at D Mizajewski. So if you guys want to watch that, and I won't give away the, 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 the conclusion, you should go watch and see what, exactly what I did. But I did succeed in uh, getting rid of these wasps without having to spray pesticides. And I love that because you're mm. a certified garden as well, a certified, certified wildlife habitat. But um, I think this is, this is the whole point. You know, there is coexistence in that, okay, sometimes we have to do these things that, you know, we don't want to do, um, you know, but there are alternative methods 
to doing that. And I think that was such a great example. Um, and to see you dressed up in a bee suit, that was really cool. So that, that's, that's a one major reason everyone needs to go and watch. But yes. um, I know I was watching you last night going, okay, go David. Oh my God. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I, I, I take the, the, the sting allergy very seriously, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I went into this not even knowing that that was an issue at hand. I just knew that I didn't want to nuke these bee houses that had native bees nesting right. them as well and put toxic pesticides out into my, the re into my yard, into my habitat that supports so many bees. I mean, my, my, my yard is literally teeming with bees right now and all of my native plants um, and other pollinators like butterflies and even wasps. You know, there's lots of different species of wasps that are you know, not as aggressive as, as yellow jackets are. So I want them around. And, um, but when I got the diagnosis of, of, from the doctor saying, you, know, you really have to be careful, um, I am fortunate that I have friends that have uh, honeybee hives uh, that live right around the corner. So last night I, when I was walking my dog, I stopped by their house and I said, I gotta borrow your bee suit. And uh, I, I took it seriously. I put the bee suit on to go and remove the final remnants of the hive. And there were still some wasps in there, so I'm glad I had it on. I can see what you're going to be wearing for Halloween this year. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you it know, won't really be a costume because I, I, I actually I am using it in real life. <laughs> I know. That's the thing. And I think this is such an important uh, thing to talk about. Nancy's allergic to bees. She got stung oh. by a wasp recently. Um, Actually, it was, yeah, last year. You know, monsoon season out here in, in Tucson, Arizona, in the desert southwest, brings out all kinds of critters. We've got tarantula wasps that really do go in and oh, yeah. they munch on tarantulas in the hole. They are the coolest it's thing. super cool, but um, you got zapped really bad. Oh, yeah. And I was hitting her with sticks to try and get the thing off of her when we were <laughs> oh, on my the gosh. Hike. But it can hurt, But and we were worried because she's allergic to bees, but you were it welted up. I gave her some wine. We take that on the trail. Don't tell anyone. But she was fine, and I put some. I put it on her on the beast thing, and she. I mean the wasp thing, but she was okay. But this is an important thing because when we talk about uh, creating gardens that are for bees, you know, pollinator gardens and bee gardens, and you know, having the bee boxes like you did. Um, sometimes, especially families and schools may go, no, we don't want to do that because of stings, and so. Um, I think sometimes there's that fear, that initial fear that prevents people from taking that extra step. So any any ideas of how to get past that with people to, um, of where to place, maybe move the garden away from, you know, heavy traffic zones, that kind of thing, so that they know that yeah. they can still do it. So th this is partly what Be Sponsible is all about. And, and maybe we should start there. Be Sponsible is yeah. a campaign that the National Wildlife Federation has been doing um, since March, um, and we're going to be doing it all through the summer, to just start by raising awareness about what bees are, why they're important, the difference between bees and wasps, and how we can help them. Um, and so we've got a whole series of blog posts that um, mostly have been written by me, chock full of information. So if you if you search um, our blog, you'll find them, or if you just Google Be Sponsible or go on to BeSponsible.com, um, you can get access to all of them. But um, but so I think the first step in getting people over the, the kind of knee-jerk reaction that we're taught, even as children, about bees as dangerous and scary and you don't want them around is, is education. And so, you know, we started talking about wasps. Bees actually evolved from wasps. Um, bees, in a way, are kind of like vegetarian wasps um, because they evolved <laughs> to feed solely on flower nectar and pollen. Yeah. Um, they no longer go out and hunt the way that their wasp ancestors, you know, did. But, um, you know, bees can sting, but it's only the female bees that can sting because the stinger is actually a modified ovipositor, which is the, the, the part of the anatomy that, that insects, female insects use to lay eggs. Um, it just happens in bees and wasps to have evolved into a stinger. So, um, so male bees can't sting. And there are some, quote, unquote, stingless bees, but they're mostly tropical species. But you know, just some simple facts that most people don't realize about bees. Number one, we, uh, we all know the honeybee, um, and that's what we think of when we think of bees, but most of what applies to a honeybee does not apply to almost all other bees. So honeybees are actually the exception to the rule. So that means that most of what we think we know about bees is actually wrong. So for example, bees, most bees don't form hives. Most bees don't have a queen. Most bees don't make honey. 
the majority of bees are probably not even black and yellow. Um, most bees that are out there are, are um, you know, metallic colored or yeah. they're, they do have striping white and black. So, you know, a lot of them do have yellow and black on them, but it's not universal by any means. There's over 20,000 species of bees in the world. And here in North America, we've got about, uh, about 4,000 species. And, wow. you know, that doesn't count the honeybee where, you know, here in North America is essentially a domesticated species. It's kind of like, you know, a, a cow is to a bison as a honeybee is to, a, you know, a wild native bee. Most honeybees live in managed hives in North America. There are some feral hives out there, but, um, you know, I, you really kind of have to think of them as a domesticated species. And their primary importance um, to us is all of the agriculture services that they provide by pollinating our crops. One in three bites of food that we eat is the direct result of animal pollinators, mostly bees and mostly honeybees. About 15% of that is from native bee pollination, but honeybees really do most of that work. So as the honeybee population has started to decline in recent years because of things like colony collapse disorder, which is caused by a whole bunch of different factors from pesticides to stress to mites and all of that kind of thing, uh, moving the hives for the agriculture uh, purposes because the hives get moved from crop to crop. Um, as that has happened, it, it's become a serious issue. Now, honeybees are not going extinct, um, but the, the, the honeybee industry is still seeing higher than normal losses every winter. And so it's a problem that really needs to be studied more and addressed so that we can change our practices so that we're not losing um, honeybees at this higher than normal rate and so that it doesn't threaten not only our agriculture system, but our economy too. Um, so that's honeybees, but we've got these 4,000 species of bees that are native here to North America. 90% of native bees are solitary. So they, again, they don't form hives, they don't have a queen, they don't make honey to feed the larvae that they're communally raising. They don't do any of that stuff. Um, instead, what, what happens is the female bee seeks out a tunnel, either in the ground or in like an old dead plant stem or like a termite tunnel or a woodpecker tunnel in, in dead and decaying wood. And what she's gonna do is lay a series of eggs in little chambers in that tunnel. And each egg will get provisioned with a little ball of nectar and pollen. And then she'll build a chamber wall, then she'll repeat the process until the tunnel is filled with all these little cells. And then she leaves. She doesn't take care of the babies. She doesn't protect them. She doesn't try to sting you if you go near. Um, and the babies hatch out. The larvae eat the pollen and nectar. They pupate. And they stay in that tunnel, um, in, that, in the nesting tunnel, until the following spring when they chew themselves out and then they repeat the process. That's and, a whole way, um, new way of chewing yourself out. So yeah, so most people don't have any clue that that's going on. And and of those, of the 90% of bees that are solitary, about 70% of them nest in, in tunnels in the ground. So an opportunity to help them is to maybe not be so zealous about mulching every last square inch of your yard. You know, if you have a, a patch of, you know, sandy, gravelly soil, that the, the bees can kind of dig little tunnels in. That could be a, a way that you can help them. Um, for the other 30% of bees that are solitary, they're seeking out little tunnels in, um, again, old plant stems, hollowed out plant stems, in um, dead and decaying wood. So if you have an old dead log or if you have a dead standing tree that the woodpeckers are working at, those are potentially places where these bees will come in. Um, you could get an old, you know, I actually have in my yard, um, one of our neighbors had a tree cut down and I went and I rolled down a big log that sits about three feet off the ground. And um, it's kind of just a little garden feature, but I drilled holes in it in the hopes that some bees might actually move in there um, to use those as nesting tunnels. Wow. But if you don't have those things, you can buy a native bee nesting house. And again, this is for bees that 30% of native bees, solitary bees that nest in you know, tunnels in wood or plant stems. And what it is really is just a little wooden structure, kind of looks like a birdhouse with no front on it. And you, what you do is you fill it with little, um, they're basically tubes and they come in all different materials. You can get ones made out of natural plant stems. Um, you can get them made out of cardboard. You can get little wooden blocks that are, you know, have little holes in them and they come apart so you can clean them out and keep parasites out. And then the, the, the bees will find it if you have good habitat around. 
and they'll nest in there. And so that's what I had in my yard. And, um, you know, for bees like orchard mason bees and leaf cutter bees, these are two common examples of bees that might show up in your garden that would use one of these nesting structures. So, um, and that of course is where the wasps also decided to build their nest. So I had to, <laughs> like, yeah, had to get rid of them. But, in there. I'm checking. Yeah. So, so That's going back to your original question, just educating people a little bit about what bees are and what they do and they don't do, I think can be a, a really good first step in helping people overcome their irrational fears so that they can, you know, they can, yeah still make a habitat for them in a safe, appropriate way that isn't going to put people at, you know, increased risk, but still helps out the wildlife. I think this is also a really good um, thing to learn about is dead wood is important wood for nature. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not supposed to take things out of national parks and, and, you know, places like that. And, you know, some like national forests, apparently you can. Um, but when you see these, you know, we may look at a tree and go, oh, that looks pretty, a dead tree go oh yeah that could you know be decorative or something but you know i remember in in sequoia national forest and uh, national park the bears were scratching the trees and you could hear the echoes of this and we're like mm. dude and yeah then there was there was a mama bear with her babies and did we run <laughs> <laughs> no we didn't actually we tried to get a better photo but um i didn't realize they were scratching you know i just we just kept as we were hiking hearing the sound and, and went to the visitor center and they're like you know that's what the bears do because it sounded like it but they were getting they're saying oh no they're getting like bees and ants and things mm -hmm. so this i never even realized that you know bugs were going in there and laying babies and i didn't even know bees And then from there, you've got, um, you know, all sorts of other things that go to try to eat them. So you got this whole ecosystem going on right within the tree. So, you know, woodpeckers are, are coming in to eat those insects. And then even things like raccoons are, are going to go and forage and try to pull out some of those beetle larvae if they can. And so it really does, you know, become a whole different level of providing for wildlife that a tree can offer as it's dying. It's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think for kids to watch this happen, like next spring, oh, remember the bees that went in there? Like now there's, you know, now there's new bees. There's baby bees coming out, you know? New bees. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, would, yeah we, we would chew yourself out and, and become a newbie. <laughs> I, I like watching those tarantula wasps out here that we have. Mm -hmm. They fly by and you, at first you think, oh, look, that's a hummingbird. No. Because they're, they're big, these oh, wasps. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know, I'm I've been hoping to see one actually go to the ground and maybe see where the nest is, but it seems like in a particular season you start to see a whole lot of them. Yeah, that's it's like the bees, the season of the wasps. Yeah, just after yeah. March we start to get an influx of bees, and we've had them kind of swarm on our our uh, patio a lot of times. Yeah, that's something to talk about the swarms. Where I saw something on Facebook or something had posted like a bunch of bees hanging on something, you know, we've had that with the bird feeder. Mm -hmm. Remember when they, oh, yeah, they, when the, they decided to, to, to hang it. in there, but <laughs> yeah. somebody so, was saying that, that they're not actually making a nest. They're not actually making a hive, but they're just resting. Like they rest together. Is well, so what, what happens with a swarm, this is something that honeybees do. Um, so, and this is how domesticated honeybees kind of escape into nature and, you know, form feral colonies. But in a, in a honeybee hive, um, sometimes a new queen is produced and, and then the old queen or maybe even that new queen, um, oftentimes will, you know, leave. And if it's the, the existing queen that leaves, a big chunk of the hive will actually follow her. So what the swarm is following is the queen bee and it's all based on like scent and pheromones. And eventually what she will do is go find a new spot to make a hive. Um, so if you see that, what you should do is don't get out the pesticides what you sh and you know don't run up and slap it or anything like that because you you know then you'll have a bunch of angry bees um mm -hmm. what you should do is quickly go online and find your local beekeeping association there are people that will that are dying to get you know a new hive going from one of these swarms and they'll come out and they'll actually collect them and they'll take them away 
So that's the best thing to do if you have a honeybee swarm like that. Oh, that's good to know. I remember yep. when we were in the high <laughs> desert gardening and they got into the bird bath. And that then so weird. I mean, a neighbor was coming over and she sees Nancy and Lisa in the garden. Nancy had to flip the top of the bird bath. And then I got the hose out because we wanted them to go because Nancy's allergic. But of course, she's the one that goes out there and flips the top. <laughs> and so I'm trying to hose it. And Jerry, our friend, she's like, girls, what are you doing? And then, then all of a sudden, this big swarm of bees just went woof right out of, out of the, the, the core part of the bird bath thing. Little, oh, wow. the stand. They were all in the yeah. stand. Uh, so they, they were likely looking to, uh, you know, create a hive in there because it was a nice yeah. close spot. I know. She said there are people for that, ladies. <laughs> but, I, but it was yeah. it, it was interesting. But you do that's a, that. I'm glad you brought that up because I think again there's that fear factor of the swarm and a lot of times that's where people also think about the the African bees, right? The the yes. yeah the big you know sometimes you see that even in national parks. Yeah. Um, Joshua tree. Um, that's what we were kind of worried because Joshua Tree has that, the Africanized bees. Are they honeybees too? Yeah, they're honeybees. They're just a different strain. And um, they, um, they're they not really as common as they once were, not really much of a concern. But yeah, they just tend to be a little bit more aggressive in protecting their hives. So, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, taking it back to our native bees, most of our native bees are completely docile because they don't make hives. Now, uh, bumblebees, of course, are the uh, the main exception. They are hive formers, but even bumblebees are not particularly aggressive. I mean, yeah, if you go to their hive and stick a stick in it, they're going to come out and defend it. But um, most of our native bees are like you can actually hold them in your hand, and unless you really try, they're not going to sting you. So um, that's just one difference. And, and again, one misperception that we have about bees, you know, we hear these news reports, you know, about the Africanized honeybee and, you know, in the 80s yeah. when they were kind of spreading north from mm -hmm. where they started out um, being bred in, uh, in Brazil, I believe, and kind of moving up through South America and Central America up into parts of the uh, southern U.S. But, um, but m the important thing to know is that that, again, is the exception to the rule. Swarming bees, beehives, aggressive bees, these are not characteristics of most bees. And again, that's one of the main goals of Bee Sponsible is to just raise a little bit of awareness about these mm -hmm. guys and emphasize how important they are. You know, I mentioned with honeybees how important they are for our agriculture system. But yeah. the other thing to remember is that the like flowering plants rely on, on insects, mostly bees and a few other species like hummingbirds and a few bat species to pollinate them. But most of that's happening from bees. And think about this for a second. Through coevolution, you know, the flowers evolved, have these pretty colors that actually lure the insects in. They have a delicious food source in the form of sugary nectar and also protein-rich pollen, which some insects eat. By luring those insects in, what they do is they cover the insect in pollen when it comes to drink the nectar or gather the pollen. That insect flies over to the next plant. Some of that pollen rubs off onto the um, the stamen, uh, which is the male part of the flower uh, of the next plant, and fertilizes it, or I'm sorry, the pistil is the female part of the flower. Um, and basically what happens is that through coevolution, plants have tricked wildlife to allow them to reproduce because they can't pick up and move and go on a date with the next plant, right? So, so that's how plant reproduction happens with flowering plants. If we don't have those insect pollinators, mostly bees, plants can't reproduce. Plant populations wouldn't exist the way that they do today, and plants form the foundation of habitat for all other wildlife, including humans. Yeah, so okay. all those birds that you love, love seeing in your yard wouldn't have the seeds and the berries and the nuts and the fruits that the, all the plants are providing. That's the direct result of the pollination of wild native bees. And a lot of those foods we like to eat too, and as I, as I mentioned, about 15% of our agriculture is reliant on on our native bees as well. So literally, if bees were to disappear tomorrow, life on this planet would stop. That's how important they are. And, and, and we're, we're yeah. really getting critical. I mean, it's, we're getting to a crucial point with that, um, with the lack of bees. And, you know, talking about the agriculture, absolutely, it's important. But I also feel that um, the world of agriculture is also responsible for being unbesponsible. <laughs> for hurting bees with chemicals. Sure, yeah. I mean, modern... And yeah. Industrial agriculture relies a lot on pesticides. They, um, the, the 
know, the farming practices of industrialized agriculture don't leave a lot of room for any native plants or native habitat. So yeah, these are things that the ag industry really needs to do a better job of. And it's one of the things that the National Wildlife Federation has always worked on. In fact, we worked um, to get some good wildlife provisions in the latest version of the Farm Bill that just passed um, oh, yeah. so that we can begin to help the ag industry be a little bit better about some of that. Um, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, we can all be doing stuff, though, in our own little piece of the earth, our own yards, our own gardens, our own neighborhoods. And it's the same message that I talk to you guys about whenever I talk about our Garden for Wildlife program. Um, and that's be responsible as part of that. It's all about providing through your native plants, first and foremost, food and shelter, places to raise young, and then you throw in a water source. And when people do that, um, you can do it with bees in mind. And it literally is just planting a diversity of blooming native plants that are going to provide nectar and pollen, you know, from spring all the way through until fall, until, you know, things go dormant. Um, or in your guys' case, the rainy season and the dry season, depending on where you live. Um, but if you do that, you'll provide, you know, everything that these bees need, as well as committing to not spraying pesticides everywhere. And, um, and it's really as simple as that. And again, you throw up some nesting houses or you leave a bare patch of soil for ground nesting bees or an old log in your yard for the cavity nesting bees. And, you know, you've, you've done your part to make sure that there's going to be a healthy bee population, which, by the way, if you're a vegetable gardener, Native bees are actually really important to help, you know, crops like tomatoes. Honeybees can't pollinate tomatoes, and tomatoes can kind of self-pollinate, but they produce much more fruit if bumblebees come in, which have this thing that they do called buzz pollination. So they grab onto the flower, and they buzz muscles um, near their wings, and it causes the pollen to kind of fall out. And so with with access to native bees like bumblebees, tomato crops are going to be, are much going to be, going to be much more um, big and large and productive. So little th simple things like that. Squash bees are a native group of bees here in North America that evolved with squash and pumpkin and gourd plants that are native to North America. And they still pollinate our crops. In fact, it's really green? cute. The males hang out inside of the, the, the squash flower, you know, the yellow yeah. squash flower. And they sleep in there at night so that you know, they, those flowers open and close so that they're sitting there ready to go looking for females as soon as the flower opens in the morning. Okay, I'm sending, cool. you photo, I'm sending you photos because I think that I've taken a lot of bee photos thinking they're like little beetle fly things. Like flies Could or be. beetles. Because I've got these little green in these squash flowers. Um, we were in a wildlife refuge and there's all the native um, squash blooming. And these little like coyote melons. Yeah. And uh -huh. there's these little bugs on them and I thought they were beetles. And I thought it were squash beetles, but now I'm, I'm gonna have to go back and look because they were the coolest like lime green on them. That might be a huh, beetle. Interesting. Though. Well, that's probably not uh, the squash bees. They are kind of a, a yellow and black furry little okay. bee. But um, yeah, the, I, I'm not sure what those could be, but I'm gonna, there's I'm all sorts of cool them. insect interactions <laughs> with lots of different plants. But um, but yeah, so, so, you know, we each have that opportunity to create a bee-friendly garden following the principles of the National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife mm -hmm. program. And, and again, Be Sponsible. It's a fun name. That's what this campaign is all about. And if you go to besponsible.com, you're going to find out all sorts of different ways that you can make bee-friendly habitat and how you can actually take it beyond your backyard, too. I mean, we're encouraging people to work with their community leaders and make mm -hmm. proclamations that, you know, kind of commit to doing things like planting more natives throughout the community to support pollinators like the bees and like the monarch butterfly, which I've talked to you guys about too, that has also plummeted in population by like 90% mm -hmm. in the last 20 years for the same reason, because we destroyed the habitat by ripping out all the native plants and putting pavement and asphalt and lawns um, or farm fields, <laughs> industrial farm fields. and you know, we spray pesticides everywhere that kill the insects and also mm -hmm. kill their native plants that they need. So, you know, we're Be Sponsible is trying to get kind of top down, you know, to the grassroots level all the way up to the community leaders to make these commitments. And if we each did it, it would make a huge, huge impact mm -hmm. on the wildlife habitat in this country and hopefully a huge impact on bee populations. Um, you mentioned that 
the, the, the sort of the crisis of bee decline. You know, we were talking about honeybees a minute ago, and I was saying, you know, honeybees are not going to go extinct. The problem is, is that it's it's going to have economic impact, and it's going to be uh, you know less return on the investment for beekeepers, and it's going to have you know sort of ripple through our economy if they have to if they have to experience these really really high declines every year. So it's really important that we find solutions to the honeybee collapse. At the same time, all of those 4,000 native bee species are out there, and many of them are already significantly declining. In fact, the first North American bee to be listed as an endangered species is the rusty patch bumblebee that happened last year. And it used to be a common species over the Midwest and North, Northeast area and is like now found on like less than 1% of its original habitat. Okay. And that's because again of habitat loss um, and, and overuse of pesticides and things like that. So um, many, many, many other bee species are declining and many, many more. We just have no idea what their populations are because no one has studied them. So it's, it's something that we really need to pay a lot more attention to, or we're going to see more bees go the way of the rusty patch bumblebee. So, David, don't the farmers, I, I mean, most farmers we know seem to know a lot about birds and animals and plants. And I think what I'm wondering is how aware are they? Um, because it seems to me if they knew there were natural pollinators to help them grow their crops, um, that it would be in their interest not to use the pesticides, and they would probably have bigger and better crops. Well, you're, you know, it's it's a lot more complicated than just telling somebody the right thing to do. You know, right. you're talking about a probably trillion plus industry, you know, with major corporations with tons of money involved, people that have no connection whatsoever to the actual farming process. You know, that are making these chemical products, they're making a lot of money about uh, uh, selling them to farmers, um, you know, convincing farmers this is what they need to do, that they're going to fail if they don't use them. Um, there's a lot of politics involved. So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's a much bigger issue, but taking it back to personal action, um, in addition to creating those bee friendly gardens and getting your neighbors and your community involved. You know, we have to act beyond, you know, those personal actions. So, you know, again, at, at the National Wildlife Federation has a whole branch called National Wildlife Action Fund. Um, mm -hmm. And we need everybody's voice to join us when we're pushing for a particular piece of legislation or trying to promote wildlife friendly policy. Um, and so that's another way, like if that, if it, if it bothers you that these big companies and big ag are, are doing these things that are not bee friendly and not wildlife friendly, well, let your voice be heard. And joining us at the National Wildlife Federation Action Fund is a really great way to do that. I, I, we we I sign agree. your petitions all the time. And if everyone, if you go to nwf.org uh, forward slash garden for your garden side of it and get your garden certified and get started. Um, but nwf.org, when you go there, it's like a haven of information and uh, ways that you can take action for public lands, for, you know, wildlife. And, and that's the thing. It, I think what's happening with the bees is a really good example of how the ecosystem works. You know, how you were saying like how it directly affects other wildlife. Uh, as a bee dies, then it's no food for the woodpecker, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, then it directly affects us as human beings. And I think sometimes, you know, when people go, oh, we lost one bee species, who cares? Well, there's gonna be a whole bunch of wildlife and, and plants and uh, it, it's gonna affect everybody in one way or another. And yep. that's what's always kind of hard to to get people to understand is like one right. species matters. And that, you know, that, you know, rusty patch bee probably or bumblebee probably, you know, pollinated a specific plant that was a specific food source for this plant uh, animal yep. over here. Um, and again, it's, you know, if you're especially growing your own garden and, and, you know, that's what I think is so important. We can take personal action. And not have these huge, um, huge agricultural crops that come in and uh, be part of your community. You can say no to that at the local level as well, because sometimes that happens depending on where you live. That suddenly, hey, we're going to, you know, do this, and these chemicals will affect your garden just because of that. The wind and these chemicals will come in, but it is all those corporations 
all tied in there, just like the oil, just like well, all of it. The, it's these major corporations. That's why we can fight it. Yeah, I think, and one of the best ways is to buy organic, mm -hmm. because I think mm -hmm. the consumer dollar talks loud. Mm -hmm. It really does. And so, if, yeah, you sign the petitions, plant what you can native wise in your own garden and have some patience because it does take a while mm -hmm. for things to balance out when you first right. plant a garden it doesn't always work exactly the way you think it's going to but if you just leave it and just keep you know watering and keeping it natural eventually a set of bugs and animals move in and balance each other out exactly and and it david one thing i before you go i wanted to touch on this um not everybody has a backyard you know, there's people mm -hmm. living in apartments and condos mm -hmm. and townhouses. Um, but what I love so much about NWF, um, what you guys are doing with the gardens is this community part of it. Mm -hmm. um, really, you, you've said this, I think, the first time you came back on the show is, you know, not having these dead spaces and, you know, having these communities that thrive and team with wildlife and birds and bees, but we can do it no matter, you know, what our situation is. I mean, even if you just put a dead log on your patio, you're going to maybe help a bee. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just thinking that people can do yeah. little things, but um, this can go into communities, all kinds of like schools, right? We can look at, you know, the first thing is the native plants. No matter what, if you do that, you're helping the birds, the butterflies, and the bees, right? So we could Correct. do this in community gardens, churches, businesses, that kind of thing. Absolutely, yeah, and and the I mean, if you pl if you can plant something, whether it's in the ground, if it's in the little grass median on the next to the sidewalk, if it's in containers on a deck, a balcony, or a roof, or maybe it's at a community garden if you don't have your own garden space, you can be helping out the wildlife. Mm -hmm. And you are absolutely correct. Like we want people to do this in their own yard and their own space, but we want them to take it beyond their backyard. Hook up with a local school. Plant a schoolyard habitat. We have a whole program called Schoolyard Habitats that's all about helping schools plant these wildlife gardens and then use them as outdoor classrooms. Get your office building to plant a butterfly garden or a bee garden. Go to your, you know, your local library. I mean, there's just a million and one places in any given community that you can be making better for the wildlife population by adding in more native plants, encouraging them to not use pesticides, following the principles of the Garden for Wildlife program of food, water, cover, places to raise young. And all of those spaces, by the way, are eligible to be certified by the National Wildlife Federation as official certified wildlife habitats, which is really just our recognition. It's not a legal thing or anything like that. But, you know, we want to let people know that they're doing the right thing and we want to reward them by putting our stamp of approval on it. And of course, you can get a yard sign and put it out and that helps spread the message. And it's a fun thing to do. The other neat thing about it is that we are participating in this really cool campaign called the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. And so every time somebody certifies a garden space with the National Wildlife Federation, it counts towards this goal of reaching one million pollinator-friendly gardens that a whole bunch of organizations are promoting. And, um, and we've already got several hundred thousand and we want to take us over that finish line. We need a few hundred thousand more. So again, all you have to do is participate in our Garden for Wildlife program and get your garden certified, and you'll it'll count towards the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. Cool. Right on. I, I like, like this. I know. I can't wait. Nancy and I can't wait to be back on the road traveling again, and um, I'm going to start knocking on every door. <laughs> get in there, everybody. <laughs> I want to see communities. I, I really to whole communities taking the Bee Proclamation. Be a bee responsible city, uh, be responsible school, be responsible church. You know, yep. I, I think that if everyone can get together and do that, you know, it's really going to take on big ag in some way. Where, I'm sorry, that's just my one sided thinking of that of, hey, you know, we're going to have. They change. We can change a landscape. They change by public opinion. Yes. Especially when it's followed with the dollar. And, and with action. And so it's like, raise your voice but also take action in doing the the actual work of planning a native plan and guess what it's fun it's not really work and um anyone can do it and it doesn't yeah. cost as much money as an ornamental and <laughs> they don't yeah. take as much water so there's you know and you'll get more wildlife and it's just it's good it's healthy it's, it's fun yeah and, uh, it's 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 a no-brainer all around um i do want to mention before i go a couple yeah. other really fun ways that folks can support the whole idea of, of Be Sponsible and Wildlife Habitat Garden. So part of the Be Sponsible campaign is the social media 
piece yeah. of it. And so Be Sponsible will donate $1 to the National Wildlife Federation every time people post on social media and use this really fun hashtag, hashtag don't kill my buzz. We were oh, talking like about that. loving our wine. Well, this is a yes. fun little play on that, right? So uh, <laughs> if you use hashtag don't kill my buzz and you tag at be sponsible on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, the National Wildlife Federation is going to get $1 from them to support our work with our oh, Garden for Wildlife cool. program and all of our pollinator friendly work, including some of the, you know, that ag work that I was telling you about um, on the farm bill. And so um, it's a really easy and simple and fun way for everybody out there listening to help support the cause. Um, even if you don't, even if you're not a gardener, you feel intimidated by starting a wildlife garden, it takes two seconds to do that. And the post could be anything. You know, you could post a picture of yourself smiling. Um, if you wanted to do something additional, the if you go to besponsible.com, they are selling a t-shirt that has this cool little bee design on it and the phrase, don't kill my buzz. And that's a really <laughs> fun one. way to do the whole social media campaign because you can take a selfie in your t-shirt and use the hashtag and tag at BeSponsible. When you buy a t-shirt, the National Wildlife Federation gets $5 from every t-shirt purchase. So is- it's a really great way to support the program, and it's something fun, and you get a cool t-shirt out of it, too. I want that t-shirt. I need more than one. Yeah. We need it for every park visit. So that- <laughs> you can buy as many as you like, and we'll get $5 for every one. So uh, it's a really um, fun and important thing that people can do to help support this work and you know, keep up going at the National Wildlife Federation, because we are, of course, a, a, a nonprofit. So, you know, we rely on folks' donations to keep the work happening. Absolutely. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done because there's a lot of things going against the environment right now. So that's right. It's, uh, definitely one of those years. So um, absolutely. Uh, everybody, again, nwf.org, go there. Uh, go uh, nwf.org forward slash garden so you can get certified Uh, Get Gardening. There's so much information on their uh, projects with kids, how to set up a schoolyard, uh, you know, wildlife habitat. So it's got everything in there, kinds of plants, what plants to plant in your zone. Everything is there. And you can follow David's blog through there. All the social media is on there as well. Again, besponsible.com is another great resource. And uh, start hashtagging Don't Kill My Buzz. Can I do that every Champagne Sunday? <laughs> Don't kill yeah, my buzz. Yeah, you can. Every single time you do it, we get $1 up to $100,000. So you know you how much wine we goal. drink here? Oh, my goodness. You're gonna, you're, <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I mean, it's gonna be you got to put your wine drinking to, to good purpose, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to go through because this, you've really made me think about all these different bees. And when we were in Pinnacles National Park, Mm -hmm. Uh, in Central California, they have 400 bee species in their park. It's one of the top uh, bee species places. And we talked with some of the rangers and one of them, uh, Paul Johnson is Mm -hmm. a a botanist and biologist and took us around and he's a moth man. He's into moth. moth He's a moth man. And it's so funny because it's just like you, David, I remember the, the frogs and the toads. I'm like, it's this and this. You're like, no, if you think it is, but it's not, no. And then I was no. like, it's this moth. No, it uh, doesn't matter what I look at. I'm like, no, <laughs> but um, you learn, but that's how you learn is, you know, and you know, go on David's Facebook or Twitter and tweet him and, and say, Hey, I found this bee. What is this a bee or is it a, but, you know, um, yeah, a, I'll, a I'll do my best to help identify. I can't, I yeah. can't promise because there's 4,000 of these things and you really have to be an expert, but I do know a lot of the leading bee experts. So if I don't know, I can hook you up with one of them. Because that's cool because that's, cool. I want people to know about that because that's part of the, um, being, be responsible is to actually start to identify and know them and uh, realize what they do. That's what Pinnacles, it blew my mind. And they were saying mm-hmm. that when people find that out, some people are scared to go to the park. And what you're saying is telling you, hey, you know, go to the park. <laughs> you can go yeah. to the park yeah. and look at native bees, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to start digging out my photos and I'm going to be hashtagging uh, if, don't kill my buzz a lot. So I love it. Yeah, Thank that, you. That little bug that we see in Arivaca all the time, that little, I don't think it's a bee, but it's got this little snout. You know yeah. the little ones that that kind of yeah crawl, yeah they they eat with us. I'm gonna I'm gonna they come and they watch and they crawl on you and they don't sting. They're kind of a tanny pink thing with a little snout. Yeah, he's hmm. like it's, he's really cute. It looks gonna, like a crawfish in a way. Yeah, um, it's weird. I'll send you a photo. Yeah, Just yeah. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I know, but that's what we look at. We're like, what are I'm you? I'm into you bugs. Around. I think I'm going to start a bug Instagram account. Yeah, we <laughs> see, we see that. You know, we named them because we see them every time we go. And they like Nancy. They do. 
I don't know what it is. Oh, there you go. Bugs are our friends. <laughs> they, they are. David, thanks again for joining us. Uh, everybody, uh, David is our uh, garden, our backyard wildlife habitat expert on blendradioandtv.com. So if you go there, you'll see him in our expert department, and we also feature him in Big Blend Radio and TV magazine. And again, nwf.org forward slash garden. And sign up for their newsletters, too, on nwf.org and nwf slash garden. And we want to thank our sponsor today. It is Find Something Awesome. It's a book series by Matt Scott that teaches kids early in life the wisdom and life lessons adults get from self-help books. Go figure. We yeah. like it. They're we cool like books. It. They're fun. I don't care how old or how young you are. They're fun. Yeah. Uh, go to findsomethingawesome.com. And don't forget Big Blend Radio airs Sunday through Friday. Uh, the full schedule is up on bigblendradio.com. You can listen to shows go live or anytime on demand through all kinds of podcast outlets. But we want to close with some music, and we always pick nature music for David mm -hmm. and plant music. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is called Night Blooming Sirius. We just had our big bloom of Night Blooming Sirius here in the Sonoran Desert, and they are really beautiful cactus plants. They're really, really neat. Bats um, like them. And bats love them. And uh, this is off of the album Perfume of Creosote, Desert Exotica, number one, and it's by Michael and Spider. You can find them at michaelandspider.com. Thanks so much, David. You take care. You too. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.